So, welcome to the Kalamazoo Public Library, everybody. How many of you ever thought you would come, come to the library to see John Darnia? <laughs> it's pretty cool, huh? So, um, hopefully you saw it in our newsletter. First of all, my name is Kevin King. I work here at the library. Um, so, we have a newsletter. There's some copies over there on the table if you want to get on the way out. Lots of great stuff coming up. So I'm um, super excited about today's author visit. How many of you are going to see the Mountain Goats tomorrow night? Awesome. That's why he's here. <laughs> because I was like, he's coming to the, the Mountain Goats are coming. He, he's, I love his books. Let's bring him to the library. So that's why, that's why we're here. So I'm author of three best-selling, New York Times best-selling books, Wolf and White Van, Universal Harvester, and his newest book, which is almost sold out with Dean back there in the bookstore. Mich Dean from Michigan News, everyone. Give a great big round of applause. If you haven't been to her bookstore, you should go. Michigan News Agency. John went there today and loved it. So it's endorsed by, by John. So, And then the Mountain Goats, the 20, their 21st record, Bleed Out, which I'm loving so far. Hopefully you are as well. Um, I don't know what else to say other than I want to introduce Mr. John Darnio. In, in New York, if you touch your own microphone, uh, the union guys come back and say, no, that's not your job. It's awesome. Uh, uh, let's see here. Um, there's, as with all my books, uh, this is a book of reveals, right? The best parts are the parts where something gets revealed, right? But then people also want to want to want to get to those parts uh, on their own. Um, but uh, let's see here. I had I was backstage trying to pick. Uh, Trying to pick what to read for you first. Um, and also, I try uh, some of the violent stuff is, is like really incredibly violent in this book. Uh, I'm proud of that, but I also don't want to subject people to it who just came out to hear a reading. Um, uh, oh, you know, I like the way that ends. It's a little long, but uh, so, so. This book is in seven parts, um, and it's a it's a mirror structure where parts one and seven are speaking to each other, and two and five, and uh, it's our two and six and three and five, and in the middle is its own thing. Um, it's written the the principal narrator is a guy named Gage Chandler who writes true crime books, and his first book got made into a movie, so he made his name enough to keep working in the in the genre. Uh, and that book was about a woman who became known as the White Witch of Morro Bay. Uh, which is a town in California, um, and her name was Diana Crane. She murdered uh, two, uh, one of two of her students who had invaded her apartment, uh, and ill intentions on her, and it was in self-defense. But uh, she went to the electric chair for it, um, and he wrote the book about it. Um, that's the main thing you need to know for this section. Uh, it, it's from his first book, which was written in the second person, addressing Diana Crane, uh, the woman who killed uh, her, her students. The drive back to school from lunch, she went and had lunch at a place overlooking the bay, uh, is even better than the drive out. The bay right there outside the driver's side window as you leave, the sun just beginning its descent into the western hills, the, the smell of the sea. People still pull up roots and move to California on a whim all the time, and days like these are why. To find light like this in the early afternoon, you'd usually have to travel to Crete or to the south of France. But here in Morro Bay, every time the clouds clear, you feel like you're drifting through a golden moment that might never end. The rest of the day drifts by weightlessly. There isn't much to think about tying up loose ends with students who are overconcerned about their grades, reviewing basic concepts for final exams. Nothing really new to the students who've studied all year, and nothing the ones who are behind will suddenly be able to grasp. You'll be easy on the ones tried and up short. You see their faces as you go over material from two months back, their exaggerated concentration, as if the right attitude now might mitigate the disaster awaiting them when you place the exam booklets on their desks next week. There are some teachers who hold cram sessions at their own houses this time of year, University of Chicago grads. 
people who are going to change the world through secondary education, they're a little much sometimes. One has to keep one's boundaries pleasantly firm, you think. What if the students just started following, teacher, students following teachers home for free tutoring? How would you redraw the line once you let them smudge it? But nobody follows you back to your apartment from school today because they don't need to. They've already looked up your address in the phone book. This is something that will make your story hard for later generations to understand. Why is your address right there in the phone book? You're a teacher. Public school teachers have targets painted on their backs. If a student gets mad about his grades, better safe than sorry is the watchword. You never know what these kids will do. Some of them have guns. Didn't you hear about that one teacher in Massachusetts? Just 24 years old. But no, you haven't heard about Colleen Ritzer at Danvers High. Philip Chisholm will not slit her throat with a box cutter and stuff her body into a recycling barrel until 2013, 41 years from now. Jennifer Paulson won't be shot walking to work at Bernie Elementary in Tacoma until 2010. You haven't heard about Toby R. Cincino, who shot two teachers and then turned the gun on himself at Blackville Hilda High in October 1995. You haven't heard of Neva Jane Wincoop Rogers, 62 years old, on the day she was killed alongside eight others and five wounded at Red Lake Senior High School on the Red Lake Reservation up in Minnesota. You wouldn't think to take any measures to protect yourself from your students. Occasionally a few will confront you about their grades, but these are usually college-bound seniors worried about future prospects. The idea that any of them might try to hunt you down with the intention of killing you is absurd. They have a hard enough time focusing on social studies for a single class period. They're not killers, they're just kids. There's a little pastrami left, so you have that on a sandwich for dinner with some roasted potatoes. It might look modest to the outside world, a sandwich and some plain potatoes with butter and salt, some feast. If there were an especially sensitive poet walking past your window, he might muse a while about the quiet pains of solitude, maybe bleed you for a few good lines, the woman at the table reading alone, something in that vein. But in fact, you're quite pleased with yourself. While the potatoes were roasting, you've toasted the bread, steamed the pastrami over boiling water for a minute or two, and then dressed it with a little cheese and mustard. It's a joy, a little sandwich like this. The potatoes on the side a little oily, steam rising from them when you break the pieces open with your fork. You burn a little incense afterward, skimming a chapter in the Carlos Castaneda paperback you found in the laundry room last week. You ran across it halfway through a stack of books that had been left on the folding table with a little note beside, free. The teachings of Don Juan, a yaki way of knowledge, is pretty wild fare, but it's entertaining enough. It reminds you of a more grown-up version of the fantasies you used to indulge in as a child, dreams of leaving the world behind and going off to live in the desert among the wild animals. Or maybe up to some cave in the mountains, surrounded by mossy trees and cool running streams. It's lovely to think of, though for you these reveries only last for the time it takes to burn a stick of incense while idling a while on the sofa. But people entering adulthood seem to hold tight to childish dreams nowadays, even carrying them into the lives they made for themselves. Might the future hold for you some unmooring, like the one your divorced neighbors seem to be having, new and unknown horizons, unexpected spiritual awakenings? Did you have plans for the summer, plans that could have included some personal inventory, like the one all your fellow grown-ups seem so invested in at present? I don't know. It seems unlikely. At any rate, the Castaneda book in the laundry room, whatever else people might have made of it later, could have meant something or nothing. In order for us to know, someone would have needed to explore the foggy territory of your unremembered daydreams. And these aren't the avenues people pursue in the wake of a catastrophe. One thing seldom asked of those on whom disaster has laid its hand is what their future plans were before the flood. Thank you. Um, so, like I said, I can't really give good readings without spoiling a, a, a surprise or two. And one of the surprises in terms of forms is, is that, so the second, the second book is in the second person there. And it, it works this way. So the first and seven are both in the first person. Uh, when part six comes around, it's in the second person, but it's not Gage Chandler speaking to Jana Perez. It's, she has written to him many years later, 
to explain to him what it feels like to have a book written about the murder of your son, right? Um, uh, whether it was in self-defense or not. Uh, he describes that letter to us, uh, and this is uh, after, after she's been called to the police station uh, to identify the remains, uh, this is that. I'll do two sections from that. I know now that it's never going to be possible to make you understand you began again in your letter, your letter which I had spent several days reading and whose end I knew, both from recognizing where we now stood in the storyline and from the diminishing number of pages to read with her. I know this was all a waste and possibly even bad for me, you said, because I'm usually okay these days, as okay as I can be. Michael's gone now. Bobby lets me talk about him if I need to. In the end, I finally found someone who cares about me and wants to protect me. Isn't that incredible? Sometimes I can't believe it, you, you wrote. But now, when I'm telling the whole story, it's not making me feel better at all. It's not taking the weight off my shoulders. It's putting more on, more and more, the further I go. And I can't stand it. I don't think I can stand it. But I told myself when I started this letter that I had to finish. So I am going to finish. And if it's bad for me, then I guess I will get better. But I am going to tell you what I have wanted to tell you. Are you even still reading this? Please say yes, you wrote. I said yes out loud in my house in Milpitas, a place where two people had been murdered in darkness by an assailant with a sword, which was the story I had moved into the house to tell, my new story, my new book. This is the thing you have to understand, you wrote. The first circle of hell was the process. It was clear to you that procedures were the most important thing to the police but they weren't the most important thing to you. What was important to you was why they had asked you to come talk to them. Why they were asking about Jesse's friend Jean Carr, and what did they know about where Jesse had been all night, and where was he now? We think we have a lead on where he went, was as direct an answer as you got from either of the de detectives at first. They kept finding ways to not answer you directly. It made you feel like they thought you were stupid, and couldn't see what they were doing, which was something you were used to in your everyday life, but had the effect now of increasing your agitation a little with each passing moment, of deepening the reserve of dread whose membranous confines you thought surely would not be able to hold much longer as in wave after wave, the fear kept rushing in. They asked question after question about Jesse. Had he been having problems in school? Did he have close friends? And if he did, what kind of people were they? And if he didn't really have friends, how did he like to spend his free time? What was his life like at home? Had he met anybody new lately? Maybe somebody he'd been spending a lot of time with. Had he been acting strangely? Or had anything unusual at all happened? Some change in his routine? Anything out of the ordinary? It felt like they would never stop. Like they would never run out of ways to ask the same question. One officer taking notes while the other nodded as you answered, offering a little assurance now and then as they walked you through the paces, each step of which felt like an endless, barren expanse, even if everybody was being nice enough. Treating you with kid gloves, you realized, when clarity finally came. Clarity came in the form of Jesse's necklace, a silver chain with a tear-shaped turquoise chip dangling from the middle. He wore it every day. His father hated it and made cruel remarks about it and made ugly insinuations about who might have bought it for him and why. You liked Jesse's necklace. It looked good on him. And when he wore it, you felt like you were catching a glimpse of how he might carry himself when he was all grown up, when he became his own man at last, walking around in the world on his own. It was in a plastic bag now, on a table, in front of you, alongside a paper tag with some numbers written on it. Does this belong to your son? Detective Haney asked, and you put your hand over your mouth and screamed through your fingers and felt in that moment like the best possibility available to you would be to just keep screaming and never stop, to produce a scream so great that it enveloped and consumed the evidence bag and the officer holding it out to you, and the land, and the sea, and the sky, to scream and scream until the screaming somehow killed you. Because if you stopped, 
worse things than any of these would be waiting out there in the quiet, the rapidly gathering quiet that palpably stood ready to open up for you like a dark, endless cave from which you would never be free. Thank you. I, I have to find like a more positive note to conclude the reading part on. <laughs> it's, it's not all like, I mean, when I say it's not all like that, I mean, it, it's always getting to that, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but there's, uh, there's, there's sweeter stuff. Let me, um, uh, I had one marked and then I chickened out on it. Uh, let me, uh, where'd I put it? Where, where, where did I put it? Um, no, no, no. Not quite. Yes. So in the house that Gage Chandler is writing about now in Milpitas, California, which is a satellite of San Jose, I was a child there myself uh, in the mid 70s. It's now a Silicon Valley outpost, but at that time it was it was just a backwater. Um, and uh, uh, nothing really ever happens there. It's a very tiny town. Um, there was a horror movie actually from there in the mid seventies when uh, pollution was something and the local community college kids made a movie called the Milpitas Monster about a monster that eats all the trash cans. And so, uh, so then, then the trash accumulates around town. Uh, the people who own the copyright on it are absolute copyright hawks. So it's only ever on YouTube for a minute, right? But it did see Canadian release under another title, and the copyright didn't extend to Canada. So you can find the Milpitas monster if you really want it. But uh, I saw the premiere of it when I was a child. Um, but that's what Milpitas is like, where the community college kids would make a movie, and it would be a big local deal, right? Um, uh, that's where Derek Hall is growing up, being raised by his his parents, Bill and Diane. He's a, uh, he's a, an only child. Uh, he's a good student. Uh, he has friends, his, his best friend Seth is, is not a good student, but he's a very good kid. And he hangs out with a bunch of other kids. Um, he was working at a place that had been a comic store when its inventory shifted over to porn because it was becoming more lucrative. And the guy, the guy who ran it said, you know, you don't have to work here anymore. And Derek didn't mind sitting behind the counter working his notebook. He was not really attracted to the pornography in the 70s is a whole kind of different thing than this sort of insane that we all enjoy uh, every day, <laughs> so, uh, uh, whether we want to or not. Um, but uh, but so he's been hanging out there. The, the store has closed, but he still has a key, so he's been using it just as a hang spot with his friends in the afternoon. That's the sort of secret he has going on as he gets ready to go to college. Uh, and this is uh, a breakfast scene just before then. Uh, it, section three all has subtitles, and this one is provisions for the journey. Your mom made breakfast. It was dad's voice on the other side of the door, speaking in a light, cheerful tone. Derek was awake, but still sleepy, and the sound of dad calling him to breakfast made him feel like a kid. He waited to reply, luxuriating momentarily in the indulgence of his morning mood. The way our worries seem like they were smaller before we grew up is a universal feeling, or nearly so. Let me get a shower first, Derek said through a broad smile, stretching his arms over his head. There was a brief silence. It broke, his father's voice had deepened just a little, just enough, and he spoke more slowly. Your mother made breakfast, he said, and Derek understood then that he was being called to the table rather than invited. But if there were some pressing matter, it lay on the other side of some formalities mom and dad seemed to feel were essential to what lay ahead. The breakfast small talk seemed to go on forever. Dad asking mom about work, which he never did. Mom passing along the sort of innocuous coworker gossip that her husband and her son both knew she hated. He waited it out. His last autumn inside the house where he'd grown up was proving full of oddly staged moments like this. Maybe people in different sorts of families were teasing their parents this year about how awkward they'd become with their nearly grown children. Some of his friends talked about their mothers and fathers with a condescension that made him feel a little sad. He understood because he felt it too sometimes. The planet all parents occupied seemed to be growing ever more remote. He'd told a few stories too. Still, it seemed miserable to fault them for trying. His parents had given him a lot. This time next year, you'll be somewhere else, his father said finally. And this, to her own considerable surprise, was the thing that caused Diane Hall to burst into tears. Uh, 
She'd rehearsed this breakfast in her mind for days. But when she looked at Derek and imagined his chair empty in 12 months time, a feeling of profound helplessness descended upon her. She lowered her head, focusing on her pancakes, but neither her husband nor her son were fooled. Dad said then how proud, how very proud he was to have raised a young man now college bound. Mom talked vaguely but sternly about the importance of avoiding distractions, of keeping your goal in sight. They went over simple stuff for far too long. Punctuality, diligence, time management. They had a short bit about getting enough exercise out of sight underneath the table. Derek had to dig his fingers into his thighs to keep from laughing. He'd been faithful to a daily exercise regimen of push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups ever since first seeing those corny Charles Atlas ads in the comics back in junior high. The big reveal was a savings account Dad had opened for Derek years ago without ever telling him about it. He slid the passbook across the table. Its cover was worn enough to suggest that Dad had visited the bank many times over the years. Derek didn't know whether he was supposed to open it or not. He waited. Um, <clears throat> I opened that account when you were very small, Dad said, clearing his throat. And I put a little something in it every month, except in December every year. So if it's not enough, you know, uh, blame Santa Claus. Derek remembered a December morning years ago when he'd gotten up early to find a shiny bicycle under the tree. And a lump formed in his throat, which he chased down with a mouthful of food. Then he discreetly put the savings passbook into his back pocket, nodding at his father as he did so. I don't know what to say, he said. He raised a too big final forkful of pancake to his mouth. So many recent occasions had been attended by an unfamiliar but not unwelcome gravity, and it seemed to him that the best way to meet them was to remain in the moment. Be yourself. Plenty of his friends never even got a chance to think about this kind of stuff. Thank you, Mom, Dad. Seriously, thanks. His parents smiled at each other, each grading themselves a little in their minds. Points for poise, points for focus. He saw his opening in their exchange. Guess I can go get that shower now, he said, rising to his feet, clearing his dishes and taking them to the kitchen, wondering as he walked at how serious adult life seemed from the outside. The outside, whose distance from the inside kept growing shorter every day erasing itself as it went. So I never have a full sense of like, you know, like poetry readings, the poet just reads for an hour, right? Uh, uh, in the book business, they're always encouraging you to pick shorter segments. And I'm like, wait, well, yeah, you can get somewhere if you go longer, right? Uh, but Q&A can also stretch out a bit. Um, I don't... Um, if we went to Q&A right now, shoot up your hand if you would have one. Let me, let me get a, a body count. Um, yeah, we should go. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> all right. I'm going to play Phil Donahue here. And if, if, like, if we're all done, then I'll do one last reading or something. Okay. Like that, so. Here you go. Uh, when you were writing about the uh, murders in your book, did you have any true crime that you listened to or watched to study or like get inspiration for when you were uh, creating the stories? So early on... I listened, I mean, when I was a young goth, I, I, you know, dredged myself in true crime like everybody else, you know, like, especially back then. So my interest in that stuff was when I was like, you know, a teenager and just post-teenager, mid-80s. So access was different in those days. And that's a, a thing that's hard to understand if you're under 40, uh, is that, like, to have seen the Jack the Ripper scene photos, you had to work to see those. You had to know which books to look for. And if they didn't have them at your library, you had to ask the guy for an interlibrary loan and then he would look you in the eyes while you're handing over the thing. Oh, I want to see the book that has, it was Anne Eddowes, I think her name is, uh, you know, but these photos at the time were legendary, you know, like these they're gruesome. And, uh, and, and access to this information was, it was, there, there's a line he talks about, it was a sort of a gated community. If you knew somebody who was the same stuff you were into, you said, oh man, you know what you don't actually know about the Zodiac is this, right? And so forth. Um, so, well, now, as, as we were saying with pornography, is like uh, anything you want to see, you can see as much of it as you, as you want to, which is a very unhealthy state of affairs, I think. There's nothing you really do about it. But, uh, but I, I really am very careful not to overdo it, even though when I get into writing about it, I don't pull any punches. I, I go as deep as I need to. But I do, I'm, I'm not a practicing Catholic anymore, but I'm Catholic. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, in terms of, of, of guarding 
you know, your Atma or whatever against too much stuff. I don't, you know. So like there's a podcast called Sword and Scale um, that, that's true crime podcast and everybody talks about it. I listened to an episode or two. I thought it was bad for me spiritually to listen to more of that. I got enough of it to know what's going on, you know, but I didn't want too much of that. It's, I think it's, you know, it has things like, you know, the 911 call where somebody discovers the corpses of their child. I don't think there's any benefit in hearing that. I don't think, I don't think it's the same as bearing witness. Like when we talk about the Holocaust, it's important to hear Holocaust stories, to really know the exact nature of the monstrosity. But smaller, petty monstrosities of one man against another that aren't these systemic brutalities, I think we harm ourselves by hearing too many of them. I think in the realm of fiction, if that's where we want to get that, there might be some instructive value, but when it's actual human lives, it's different. And this book is kind of about that. Uh, so, so I did some. I bought a bunch of true crime books and had them in my hands, you know, and I would look at them for tone and stuff, but I didn't want to, um, you know, I think, I mean, this book is not really a critique of true crime, but there is some critique in it, right? The, 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 the narrator winds up critiquing true crime himself. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, I want to be a steward of what I'm allowing into my brain in part for less noble reasons. It's like, I just don't want to have to be troubled with that stuff. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. Right. There's more hands. <laughs> so I don't know if this is something that everyone kind of feels, uh, but I feel like your books tend to be a lot darker than, say, your lyrics. Yes. Is there a different place that you pull from? Place eventually, right? It's like, you know, I don't, I, I don't sit down and think what I'm going to do, you know? But... Uh, but songs are ballads, right? You know, that's what I write is ballads, basically. They're, they're, they all have a narrative to them, right? They're all they're, they're almost all personified. They're, they're like, if you read Browning, the poet Robert Browning, who kind of was a big pioneer in this, and like, you know, you go read his poem, The Last Duchess, and then read some, some commentary on it. That's my last duchess hanging on the wall. Well, who is this person? Well, the poem, poem explains, you, you get a sense of who the speaker is, and then you realize he has murdered his wife, right? And so, and, and that's the, the spoiler there. Uh, but... Uh, but, but well, it's hard to figure out. You have to read some critical apparatus or read it very slowly to get that. But he was a big pioneer in this and, and is one of my models that like when my speakers in my song start speaking, you have to situate yourself in their world and figure out what's going on. A book is a whole different thing. In a book, you have the responsibility and, you know, and also the privilege of saying, how much do I want to share? Like you can, you can world build your entire world and then choose to seal some off, right? In a song, you can pull a trick like that here and there. You know, main point in a song is one reveal and get out, right? And maybe that reveals the chorus and it happens three times. Hopefully, it punches a little bit harder each time it comes around. Um, but they're so different formally uh, that there's no real, you know, as to why the books are darker, I think it's because that's how I like to read. You know, that's what I like to read. With song, with music, I like to listen to all kinds of stuff. With song, I'm kind of. I'm kind of primitive at the end of the day. I may have a skill set, but I just go in and do what occurs to me naturally. Come on, where are the hands? All right. Here you go. Thank you. Um, I think that there is a common assumption in literature that every word on the page has some ultimate symbol or purpose yes. that leads to a strategy. Were there parts of this book that you decided, no, I just want to write this because that were motivated maybe by feelings or impulse? So the thing is, there's as many ways to write as there are people, right? Um, and but especially this notion that that a writer maps out everything and 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 has like and and plants the symbols and sits there and strokes his chin and goes, okay, well that. Turquoise necklace is going to symbolize the connection between Janet Perez and her son. No, none of that happens. I'm just telling a story. There's a, uh, there's a, I think I've said to interviewers enough time now that it's become like reflexive, but it's true. There are writers, I think in the 19th century, most writers would have a theme, right? This is what am I going to write about? If you're reading uh, Jane Austen or if you're reading uh, George Eliot or Thomas Hardy, Dickens, all these writers, they know what they're trying to write about. They have, they have a theme that they want to address. Maybe they learn more about it as they go. But like, you know, Thomas Hardy writes Jude the Obscure, he's wanting to talk about how it's messed up that people from different social stations can't have a meaningful marriage in England, right? And it's ruining people's lives, real human lives, right? And so he's, then he's telling a story to make that point, 
right? Uh, it's also a brilliant book. It's not too didactic, you know, a horrific book if you haven't read it, though. Jude the Obscure. Uh, when the big reveal happens in it, this is an aside. My father was an English professor, right? And they were showing Jude the Obscure on Masterpiece Theater, right? And my mom got excited and read ahead. And then she got to, the people who have read Jude will know what I'm talking about. And she got to the, the key moment and she threw the book at the wall. My father was an English professor who, whose favorite writer was Thomas Hardy. And, and, and also a, a pretty didactic fellow. I said, no, that's the whole point of the book. And my mom was like, well, he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> they had a big fight about it. I was like three. Um, so, um, so, but for me, I don't write to say something. I write to figure out what I'm thinking about, right? And the first draft is generally, uh, it's not unreadable, but it's, not, it's unpublishable, right? It's, it's too, and then, I st then, when I, then when I know where I have gone, when I have my point, then I go back and take out the stuff that, that is no longer germane to the point. Um, it's a lot like painting, I think, um, for some people. But again, there's probably as many ways to paint as there are painters. But, but yeah, so I don't, in terms of symbolism, I'm not a symbolist at all. Um, uh, I just don't work that way. Uh, so uh, if there are symbols, however, because of the way I think symbols work, I'm open to somebody saying this is very clearly a symbol for this and them being right. I don't think, you know, I, I come from the, 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 the postmodern English departments of the 90s, and I think eventually the interpretation belongs to the reader. Within reason. <laughs> so that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Sure. Can I go right here? Uh, do you have a favorite word? And if so, what is it? I don't have a single favorite word. Uh, you know, uh, you know, plectrum comes to mind, but uh, but but you know, I mean, the thing is, if you listen to the mountain goats. You can probably tell me that my favorite word is probably water. <laughs> like I say water a lot. Oh, what was I noticing? Knees. Knees. I say knees all the time. Like I, I rhyme knees with these like three times in the new record. And I'm doing, I do, there is not a message in that, right? I'm not actually going, oh, notice that I'm saying knees a lot. It's like, that's not telling you I don't have a knee fetish or anything. It's just like, I like to think about them, I guess, in, in terms of, you know, well, because they're a powerful symbol, right? That like a person kneeling can mean it's a supplicant or a person who's in a position of vulnerability, all this kind of stuff. Um, I do tend to like the words that have Anglo-Saxon roots. You know, Tolkien has this famous line about the most beautiful phrase in the English language being cellar door, right? Uh, I, I, if it was me, I would want a hard K in there somewhere. I like, you know, knock is, a, is an amazing word, you know? Uh, I like I like the Saxon roots a lot, the, the, the Anglo-Saxon words that, you know, I mean, the, the man to whom I dedicated this book, Barry Sanders, uh, I might say, I don't have a favorite word in English, but the first word in Beowulf made my favorite word in, in Proto-English. You know this word? It's what? It doesn't have a specific meaning. It means yo, right? It's a noise you make. It means I'm about to read you something and tell you an amazing story. What? Right? <laughs> it's like, and so what does it wind up meaning the way we use it now? It means what? Right. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, hello, John. What's happening? Uh, thank you uh, for coming back to Kalamazoo. My pleasure. It's uh, been a long time. It's good to be here. We, I was worried that after Craft Bar, Craft Bar closed many years ago, that was it. So well, the thing is, like, Val, who back. booked it, moved to Omaha. I've seen her a bunch of times yeah. since, but the rest of you didn't come along to Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> that was what you said on the Mountain Goats message board in 2008. When I, I believe asked you. if you'd be coming back. So. <laughs> um, my question is actually about um, distance running. Yes. Um, I'm a cross country coach and a teacher, so you're always welcome to come join practice. Oh, tomorrow, man. I, you have time. Uh, but, <laughs> this would be my long. Go ahead. What's the question? Um, just uh, from you know, following you on social media, it seems like you've picked up distance running in the past couple of years. And just huh. if you could speak to that, and maybe what do you listen to when you run? Well, I mean, I can, but it's not going to. So here's the thing I, because I lead a charmed life, one of the things I don't do on social media is complain. Right. Uh, I think people who are in my position who get paid to sing and write books, I keep my complaints to myself most of the time. Right. On Facebook, my locked Facebook, my friends can listen to me bitch all day. Right. If they don't like it, they can mute me. Right. So they know and you don't that I'm injured right now. And I have been for all, I was I was scheduled to run my first marathon last December and I was so excited and I started to have some trouble in my glute and in my right patella. Right. And I I'd been told over and over again, don't push it. Don't hurt yourself. So I didn't run the marathon. I, I could have. I was, at, I was still doing, I was up to 21 miles, right? And I've never run one before. Uh, and I was very, very excited. And long distance running is incredibly important to me now. It's a big thing for me. I've never been this physically healthy in my life. And for mental health, because when pandemic hit and suddenly we weren't making any money, I had to leave my therapist behind. Musicians, I have insurance for therapy, but I couldn't afford therapy anymore. But I didn't have running, right? Then after the glute stopped bugging me, the patella 
came back, and you probably know this is a very common story, like the injuries just kept pinging. Right now, my left Achilles has kept, I haven't, I haven't actually run at all in a month and a half, right? Uh, it is absolutely killing me. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I still think you should take up running because it's, it's the greatest thing. But, uh, but the thing about running is like, unlike, unlike a lot of other things you get attached to, there's no replacement. Like people pivot to swimming or cycling. I'm sure it's great. You know, I've gotten on the cycle, I swim. It's just not the same. You can't do those things for two hours, right? And you can cycle for a while, I guess. But, but, uh, but yeah, so I'm trying to rehab from injury. I'm right now on a prednisone medrol pack that's supposed to, it's sort of last resorty, uh, and then I can just rest, I guess. Achilles hurts less this week, I gotta say. Uh, but that's the reason I'm actually wearing my running shoes to the reading instead of some good shoes is to try and be healthy, right? So. Uh, I listen to playlists that I make uh, right before the run uh, every time. And, and I think there's, uh, sometimes I use the same playlist. When you get up to the long runs, it takes so long to build a playlist, even if you're just randomly throwing stuff in. Uh, some people do podcasts, I really can't. Uh, I listen to people talking while I run. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I listen to long playlists. Uh, if, I am, if I'm running in other cities when I tour, which is one of the great joys of my life now, um, I spent like 20 years touring, not doing this. And like now I have run in Barcelona, I've run in Madrid, I've run in London, it's so amazing. Um, I'll put Fog Hats Fool for the City in there. It's a very great one to run in Seattle too. Uh, I can go on all day about this, um, but yeah, but right now I'm injured, so I'm not running at all. And it is absolutely, uh, it's been catastrophic for my mental health. I, I, I'm doing, you know, but the thing is, they want you to do strength training. Do you know how boring strength training is? It's just not, it's so, if you don't run, is that you wind these bands around your knees and do like that. You feel hideous. You look as bad as I did just now. Whereas running, you look graceful as a gazelle. It's, it's so, anyway. <laughs> you wonder why you use knees a lot, because you're. So yeah, yeah. no, exactly. A, yeah, well the thing is like, you know, I got air the other night, because I jump up and down on stage in dress shoes. This is not good for my running legs, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I'm not gonna stop jumping up and down. <laughs> So I've been trying to come up with like a great question to ask about chapter nine and universal harvester Step nine because it made me cry today on my lunch break. Um, well, I like to make people cry. Yeah. Um, Cause I like to cry a lot. Yeah. So I like to share that, but I can't formulate one right now. So I will ask something skewed towards which one is chapter book. nine. Uh, Jeremy's dad goes on a date. Oh, I am very proud of that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But I guess uh, I, I listened to a podcast with you on it recently that's like called The Loser's Club. It's a Stephen King podcast. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you, hear, did you hear the episode the next week where Stephen King gave me yeah, props and I died? Is, yeah, this is, yeah <laughs> this, is my, this is my question because um, I can't come up with something like, oh, oh so philosophical about you, this amazing book. It's all good. Um, Stephen King is like, I wonder what it's like to live with this guy's brain. And I just like, I want to know how you feel about someone who is such like a titan in fiction yeah, you yeah. know like how they think about you in like such a different way well the thing is i suspect given how 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 capable that guy is of writing books that, that that's like, he says that but he knows <laughs> that's like he knows better than i do right so that like you once you get going you know uh in one of these things you are uh, it's not possessed. It's not, and I don't believe in inspiration the way people talk about it. It's like it's, it's work. It's one of my big shticks. It's like it's labor. You sit down to do it, but but this is true at any job that you're good at, right? It's like once you start doing the job that you know how to do, you sort of are in a zone. It's it, it's all like dancing at the end of the day, right? Once you're in the steps of the dance, you're both thinking about it and not thinking about. It. You're free inside the process, right? And that freedom sort of is walled off from the world. Is a thing. Uh, I'll tell you this, that sort of illustrates what, what that's about. I have two children now, right? And, uh, and there's two parents in the house. Uh, so two parents should be watching two children, right? That's, that we're both available. But my wife, who, with whom I've been for over 20 years, um, if I'll be monkeying around on the guitar, and then I, she can hear if, if, I, if I'm starting to enter the zone that's gonna turn into some maybe good, right? And I noticed her like uh, nine or 10 months ago, right? You know, I was sitting there, I was going back and forth and back and forth, you know, kids come in and check me. I'm trying not to go, no, I'm not, I'm busy. I'm trying not to do that, right? You know, but I'm sure I'm giving off the vibes of like, no, I'm not really actually here. And, and she very quietly, when one of the kids was running toward the door, I saw her shut the door to the bedroom, right? And she understood like that, like I'm in this pocket, right? 
pocket's a useful concept. Um, you know, music, when musicians are playing together, they're said to hit a pocket when they're when they're playing together, and it sort of feels like the groove could just keep going. You know, uh, if you listen to Parliament Funkadella, they're always in the pocket, right? Or James Brown's late, the, the James Brown's great fans of the, of the mid 60s, when they hit the pocket, it's just you feel like I'll never forget the first time I, I listened to it. Sorry, as an aside, but they, they released a James Brown box set in the 80s called Star Time, right? And it was the first time you could get the the long mixes of the singles that had been split into two sides in the 70s because because they didn't have dance 12 inches then so it got cold sweat everybody knows the song cold sweat bum, 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 right but you there was cold sweat part one and part two all these songs were part one and part two in the 80s they released star time you could hear these seven eight minute workouts and they are like going into a profound state of prayer right that's when they hit that pocket it's the most incredible thing in the world right it's some of the greatest music ever recorded and uh and well, you may or may not be writing any, well, you're not writing anything that good no matter who you are, right? But when you're in the process, you feel like you're in that pocket, you're in your version of it, right? You feel like you've got a bunch of band members, you have a bunch of faculties all working at once. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so it feels kind of, it's very lucid, so I don't want to compare it to a drug state, but I would compare it to what I imagine a state of, 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 of real communion with in prayer is like, you know, what I imagine that that level of having thought a lot about the person you're praying to, person or people, right? Having spent a long time in devotion doing that and then entering into the prayer and being in that zone. It's kind of like that. Here you go. John. Yes, ma'am. It's you. You're in the same room that I'm I in. am, but I'm uh, nobody special. I'm just a guy who talks a lot. Oh, man, that's so not true. <laughs> it's so totally happy. true. So happy <laughs> I, have a, I have a skill set, but I, <laughs> I, I have a way I'm always trying to diffuse people thinking that I'm special. I talk about how my feet smell because <laughs> they smell bad. <laughs> so. Well, that's right. I only listen to Mountain Goats. So. <laughs> um, hi, thanks for being here. Uh, I am curious. I've been thinking as people are talking and as you're talking, um, if while you're writing a book or while you're writing a song, if you like abandon the idea because maybe you talked about like a song is good with just one reveal and then you get out. Yeah. Um, do you end up abandoning ideas for like a book and you're like, you know, this would be a better song or vice versa? No, I, I can't think of any cases where a song has turned into a book or where, a, I, I mean, I'm, sure, I'm certain some book ideas have wound up going into songs, but I don't notice if that happens because songs usually spring from details or phrases, right? And it happens pretty quickly. Right? I'll have, I have, sometimes I have, well, here, here. Um, usually when I read these, then I won't wind up using that one, but I have a long standing. Uh, notes page. Where's my titles notes? Um, oh, I know which one's never going to get used. But like, <laughs> here. So there's a song on Dark in here called "Let Me Bathe in Demonic Light." Right. Uh, well, that was that started out as a title in my notes app. Right? I just I had it as a title. It came out. Then when I had to write one day, you know, like I was in the moment. So I just, what should I do? I open this up, and I go, "Oh, okay, that sounds good." Right. Well, on the other hand, the one beneath it says, "Why'd they cap well?" Right. Well, that's not going to happen, but there is a song called The Destruction of the Super Deep Cola Borehole Tower that's about a capped well. Right? So, so, uh, so those are how those work. I mean, they don't always have a title first. Sometimes I'll start writing a song, and then I'll go look at my titles and see if that can actually inform the next verse and see, see where I'm going. You know, uh, And there's some that are never going to get used. Dirty Nightgown. That one's been in there for like seven years. <laughs> Dirty Nightgown's not going anywhere. It's just never gonna, every time I look at it, I go, it seemed like a good idea when you wrote it down. But it's never going to happen. So, <laughs> but yeah, but like, but I also like when I can, when I, when I, when I can see that I was like, you know, like I have several pages of these, bunches of them, and here's one where like, like a, a bunch of them actually happened, right? The last place I saw you alive did that. Harbor me did that. Um, Picture you in blue jeans as a guy bleeding out song. Well, no, but I did write bleed out. Right? <laughs> so, so yeah, so so that's how those work. Books are so giant. Uh, that that when you're in book space, it, it it's very enveloping. It doesn't it doesn't. Uh, there's no cross contamination. It's yeah. I mean, it's all. I think of creativity as you know, as, as a a mood or a spirit. So it's all the same stuff. I mean, here there was. This is a long story. Um, there was a a CD I had that I bought. Uh, from some guy in Kansas in the late 90s. 
who was a therapist, right? And people have been experimenting for years with the therapeutic uses of what's called brain entrainment, with trying to trick your brain into going into like the pre-sleep phases. Uh, surrealists used to try and put a, a, a piece of paper with holes cut in it on a turntable, then put the turntable, a record turntable, right? And put the turntable in front of a lamp and then close your eyes, right? And the lamp shines the shadows on your eyelids, right? And your, your, your brain tries to make sense of the shapes that are crossing across your eyelids, and it's like it's lucid dreaming. It's trying to dream while you're awake, right? Um, what was my initial point? <laughs> oh, the brain entrainment city, right? Uh, so this, you could buy, and you can do this now, and like there's apps for it, right? But back in the 90s, like people would hawk CDs that, that you'd put on, and there are machines you can buy. I have some light and sound machines that are trying to get your brain into delta or into, because there's all these states that precede sleep and stuff. Um, and those are places you usually, don't, you usually don't get to stay. As you're falling asleep, you notice that sometimes you have a crazy thought or something and then you're gone, right? What if you could stay there, right? That's what this is all about. So, so this CD I bought uh, was by some very new agey therapist guy. You'll be shocked to learn, right? And, uh, uh, and he gives a little speech before he drops you into these tones that they're playing that are going at your ears in different frequencies to try and trick your brain into this. And he talks a lot about creativity in this run-up, this guy. And he says, you know, access your creativity and understand the wellspring of your creativity to be eternal, right? All this kind of stuff, right? Um, but he doesn't talk about what you're going to do with your creativity. And prior to this guy's deal, I was thinking about creativity as regards what? As regards writing something or painting? But no, he was thinking about it like as a place, right? And this over time has had a, has been an idea I revisited over and over again, where I think the creativity is prior to the act and is actually its own space. And that the act of writing a book or a song or anything else is literally just the afterbirth, right? That's the leftovers of the creative place, right? Um, and it's kind of miraculous, right? Like that means that all these things that we enjoy are sort of just evidence of some process that can't actually be pinned down ever, right? And that I also strongly believe everybody has, right? I think I think we've all felt that. Some people feel it more in a in a uh, in an observer or reader aspect, but again, like '90s theory, I was talking about the act of reading is no less creative than the act of writing in any way, right? That you read words and put them together and make sense out of them is a miracle, right? It's like other animals can't even dream of it, right? It's like that we do this is the great. It, the guy who I dedicated this book is who I copped the shtick from, but uh, but uh, but yeah, it's like we're never going to beat reading, right? It, nothing we do. The internet, whatever. Reading is amazing, and uh, and all that creativity, like that, takes the same sort of. I think it all comes from the same place, right? I think it's all it's this it's this pre this pre accident state that's not always with you, but when it does sort of when you locate it, it's this free flow, free flowing stream, right, that you tap into, and then whatever comes out of it is this after effect. I got two more. I got one here and one back. No, we're good all night, bud. <laughs> Okay, this is kind of a two-part question. Yes. So first part is, there is a <laughs> how, how deeply into the writing of Devil House were you when you decided you wanted to do that structure with the mirror and the part in the middle? The structure came first. Okay. The structure came before anything else. I, I, I said, I want to write a big book. And I said, how will I go about that? How will I given the way my books usually are sort of like a zip, right? like, like they, and, they, and I can't wait to, to get to, you know, it's like, and I was like, you know, I have friends who are writers who write big books, and only big books. I was like, well, this is my challenge that faces me now is what, what, can, what, what might I do different? So I contemplated the structure and I got the idea for the mirror. Right? Okay, and then the second part is, did you consider the old people? When you pick that font for yes. the, for the yes. middle section, I am, I am, I am, I am, am among the old people, <laughs> and I wrote it in that font. <laughs> so, but, but no, I did have. I'll have you know, you should. Uh, 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 Sean McDonald is my editor, and it, you'll notice, like, uh, it's Ferrar Strauss and Giraud, but now it's MCD Books. He has his own division inside FSG. He's my editor. He's widely uh, known to be one of the best editors in New York, and uh, and he went to bat for you. Right. He was like, he said, John, it's time to talk about part four. Uh, those of you who haven't read it, part four is in a, in a medieval font, right? And it is hard to read. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but I wanted there to be a lot of resistance. I wanted, I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be a slow process. 
uh, and it wasn't going to express what Gage was trying to do without it. Right? It had to be that. But the, I had fonts that were way less legible that I really wanted, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I could read you the, the email chain between Sean. I said, what about this one? This, and he would say, well, how about this? And I would say, no, that's a German font, and I need an English font because it's an English thing. And then, but then we wind up talking about what the book talks about that, like any English medieval thing is actually a French medieval thing because so much English medievalism is actually French import, including the castle, right? Uh, and so I became more open to somewhat more legible fonts. I, I forget which one we uh, we landed on. If you, uh, I'm, I'm really, I really like that section. But yes, uh, we, we all suffered for it, and now it's your turn. <laughs> Cat. I know it, it, it. Yeah, there's nothing I can do about that. It's a, the thing is, I do think it detracts from this from the section to not have it set off like that. Um, I'll I'll give you briefly. We'll get the, to another question. What what what? Those of you who are wondering what's that all about? I'll, and then then I can suffer publicly uh, by reading from it. So, uh, but uh, but it goes like you know. Or some of that. When that Gorbonian came in view of the castle, he saw that the rains of the night had been hard on the land, so the sea lay upland, and the village in a dale. The flood had run straight through till morning. Now men and women of the town stood in the road, hanging their clothing in the branches of the trees to dry, for the flood had unhoused them quite. But good Queen Argoyle did espy him from her high window, which looked out upon the town and cried out, My son is returned and fell faint then and must needs be revived. Whereupon, finding young Gorbonian in the entry hall, she did lay hold of both his ears and grip them full sore, saying, where hast thou been? What hast thou done? I would have you know that Sean succeeded in getting me to trim this section, because I wanted it to be really long. I, I wanted it to be like just this, I wanted you to have to really climb the mountain of that section. And <laughs> yeah, he said, no, I, know, I, I, I think, I think, if you get it as short as I'm asking, you'll still get what you want from the reader. <laughs> okay. um, I had a question about uh, your process for getting into a character's head. Yeah. Uh, specifically, the white witch. Yes. Like, you, it was sort of uncanny. Like, I've been a young school teacher in the month of June. Right. And that was, it was accurate enough that I went from feeling seen to sort of uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, so how did you do that? Well, I'm a voyeur, so uh, no, uh, uh, no, I, I, I mean, that's what writers do. I use my imagination. My father was a college professor, but I don't think that was his experience at all. I remembered the feeling in the hallways in June in California when, when, when school's drawing to a close, you know, and you can see it on the faces of the teachers that they're in it too, if you are, if you have some empathy in you. Now, many adolescents, of whom I mean to speak no ill, but empathy is not really your strong suit when you're an adolescent, right? But but you can vibe on it. Like you notice it, especially when you're 17, 18, you're starting to understand that like these are just people. They're not, you know, there's not this wall between who they are and who, who you are. You're just a smaller version, right? And so 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 yeah, but that feeling of, of freedom and and toil and, and and that you're getting ready to break from sort of a role play you've been doing for nine months it's something i thought about a lot and I, I i do think and i think californians think this always that it's especially pronounced in california because so much of it goes with the weather right that like when june is happening in summer in california june in california is a miraculous thing it's like it, it seriously your your body just feels like like it's part of the earth uh it, it's pretty amazing summer is amazing everywhere but but california summers there's a reason why the Beach Boys are popular worldwide. Is they, they they sell that notion to everybody, and so, so yeah. So I just thought about what the end of school felt like at Claremont High School uh, for four years. Well, oh, go actually, ahead. we have got a. Oh, okay. No, it's, I I have time. I don't have. Okay. Time, so. All right. We'll do. I want to make sure we can get stuff signed too. So. Oh, I'll, I'm not going to run. I'm going to go. Oh, they asked too many questions. I'm like, I'll, I'll sign everything. Don't worry about it. I guess one question I had was that in both this and in Wolf and White Van, it was a lot of the common theme of returning to your own memories yes. and trying to re recall that childhood experience, being able to see things like that again. And one thing I was wondering is, I don't know if you find that your memories from then are easy to bring back to mind or if they feel real or accurate and if there, you have found a method to like organize them, is that part of the process? So this is a good question with a weird answer, especially because I'm always not trying to center trauma anymore. I feel there's so much space in the culture now for trauma that I don't need to be bringing my own to the forefront. Uh, you know, 
looking at other avenues. But I have a really weird, the way my memory functions is very weird. Right? Uh, some things are preserved so vividly from so long ago, and I know they're 100% accurate, right? That, you know, my therapist and I would talk about it. So my, my therapy functions in a very, my, my memory functions in a very strange way. And then other things like, they just vanish, right? Like from yesterday or, or, or you know, and, and, and things get timelines. It becomes very important to me to establish a timeline of when did I move from here to here? You see this stuff in all my books, right? This is, I am told actually a trauma survivor function, right? That it, that it does a thing in your memory. I'm not mad about that, right? It's like, it is, it's a gift, right? It's like, I, I'm not envious of normal functioning memory. I like my weird one, right? Um, but I, But I think that's what it is, is that like, you know, that, you know, when Sean in Wolf and White Van is talking about why do we have to move around so much as a kid, that's just me, right? It's like I moved from Indiana to California when I was six months old, uh, or you know, nine or ten months old, and then we moved like three more times before I landed in the house I was a child in, and then they got divorced, they moved across town, then we moved to Milpitas, right? Uh, then we moved back into my father's house because we were running for my stepfather, then we couldn't stay with dad, so we moved with my grandmother, and, uh, and all this stuff, like tracing the timeline of that becomes this like, it's a way of attempting to to tell your own story, right? Uh, so, so I think a lot about this stuff. It's like you know, not so much consciously anymore, but uh, but it's been stuff that I traced for a long time, you know. And you, in early Mountain Goat songs, right, the word memory pops up just constantly. So, afraid to stop questioning now. Let's take two more. Two and more. Then, then we... All right. Quick, e quick, easy one. That's what they all say. Yeah. <laughs> well, to start. Uh... <laughs> Do you have a favorite horror movie? Horror movie. I, well, yeah, it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, uh, which I consider a masterpiece. I mean, an utter, absolute masterpiece of American cinema. But I mean, but there's so many that are good. The Exorcist is really quite remarkable. Um, and there's, there's old, you know, like when you say what's your favorite horror movie and you pick one from the age of color, well, the age of black and white has these things that can't be reproduced. There's a sense in which Todd Browning's Dracula is really it. You know, it's just the most beautiful thing. Uh, so it's, it's hard to say, but I think, I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre is genius. Oh, so I don't watch, I, I, I've watched some movies a bunch of times. I don't really, I mean, I'm a parent now. We don't watch that stuff in my house. <laughs> it's like, like I watch movies after the kids go to bed if I have enough uh, gas in the tank and I usually don't <laughs> so so on tour now I have a blu-ray player and I'm watching Italian action movies I'm watching these things called Polizietti which are these uh, amoral uh, crime movies from from Italy that are really quite uh, remarkable <laughs> they have a lot of cars in them <laughs> here you go um, I was debating which of two questions but since you just brought up parenthood I'll I'll go with that one um, so not to I, I'm trying to not kind of be in a space where you're overly fetishizing or valorizing the role of being a parent in the way that right. that changes your perspective, right? But, but I'm interested in the differences in the way that Jesse and Jean are treated. Yes. Um, and the kind of the absence of any real development or characterization of Jean beyond a kind of archetype of the bad kid with the like kind of cliche biker dad. Yeah. Um, and then of course, like the completely devastating and, and lovely characterization of Jesse still always through his mother's perspective, right? right? Um, so I, I guess I, I'm curious because you very intentionally, obviously were developing Jesse through the lens of his mother. Right. Um, and what's her story, right? Yeah, her story of, of Jesse. Um, so you still never access him directly, but right. then with Jean, the kind of absence, and then the way that Jean continues to sort of be the shadow that allows somebody to be bad. Yeah, he's like right? a free radical, right? He's a uh, well, Jean, by the time we get to know Jean, he's not a kid. <laughs> we don't, we don't see Jean's childhood years. Uh, that's uh, and in part, this is because Jesse's house is not my house, but it's like my house. Right. Uh, one of the English reviewers faulted me for having the can of beef stew bubbling on the on the stove one too many times, right? Uh, and it was a fair fair point. I felt I, I was like mad at my copy editor because like that's your job to find that. Right? It's like, <laughs> uh, what's that? Uh, no, no. It's like uh, it. Well, it, it's intentional insofar as like in my house, my stepfather ate a lot of beef stew out of the can. Didn't he more? He loved it, right? Uh, and so, and I associate my, that kitchen 
with sometimes a can a, a, a pan of stew flying across the kitchen at somebody's head right and i've been in that now jesse's house is considerably worse than mine right so i'm never wanting to claim more space than is actually mine uh, or to exaggerate you know i mean uh, i'm an abuse survivor but jesse's house is worse right that's why jesse winds up where he does right like you know i uh, uh but uh you know jesse's uh his life is terrible but i also you know i've worked with so many kids and genes gene being raised by a dad who just doesn't give a shit you wouldn't believe how common that is i guess if it's a cliche it's because it's really common you know it's like the, the, something happened to the mom and the dad's like this isn't really my job i'll get food you know uh knew a lot of those kids you know, worked with a bunch of them down in iowa lutheran social services and uh and so yeah so uh but yeah, but Jesse, uh, Jesse's house, the details of it that ring true, those come from my house. All right, any happy questions? <laughs> and then a happy Don't note. Don't hold your breath. Yeah, I know, exactly. All right, one more. Okay, so um, I know you were a singer-songwriter before you became an author. Yes. But as like a famous person, do you have to go through the whole querying process and then you get an agent and then you get send, they send your book off to a publisher or do you just bypass all So I'm very stuff? sorry to tell you that the answer is you're right, I'm privileged. And, uh, and here's, here's how I wind up writing books. I was writing music criticism for the New Times LA and for Decibel and all around, right? And back when it was publishing in hard print, it was, it was a, a, an income stream for me. I was getting $100 for a free run review in New Times and we would syndicate then they would pay me $25. This was really significant money for me in the 90s, the 2000s. I was rent money. Right? And so I took a lot of pride in my work. And like I'm, to this day, I'll never forget being in the St. Louis airport, got a copy of this, the Riverfront Times, which was the New Times satellite. And somebody had written a letter to say, thank you for reading John Neal's reviews because he's the only guy who writes about heavy metal for you guys. And I was like, cool, I have a niche, right? So, so when... 33 and a third people, you know, that you know, actually 33 and a third of these books are about albums. Everybody pitches them every year. I had not done so. I had a job. Right? I, was, I didn't have really an idea. And I didn't, they didn't seem interested in the kind of music I'm interested in. Um, well, their editor wrote me and said, All your friends pitch us. Why aren't you pitching us? And I said, I don't know. You guys don't care about heavy metal. I said, No, you should pitch us. And I was like, I mean, <laughs> that's sort of like, that's telling me all I have to do is not drop the ball. You know? So I, so I pitched him, and, uh, and, and that was the master reality idea. And I wrote that. After that published, my agent, uh, Chris Paris Lamb, uh, who works for the firm that represents, well, he's now like the veep of this firm, uh, that does John Grisham, right? He wrote to me and said, hey, I'm an agent, and I loved your book. Um, if you ever want to write another book, I'd be happy to represent it, right? And we could sign something now, and if you never write another book, it's not a big deal, right? And I looked up his clients, and I was like, sure, you know. And uh, and then I spent the next six or seven years not writing the book, or five, you know, just like occasionally tinkering with it. I had some sort of a half idea, but it wasn't on the front burner. And then he wrote one day and said, hey, some writers work better under contract, right? Um, so if you had anything I could show around, Right. Maybe we get your contract. Maybe you could take some time off touring to finish a book. So I grabbed six chapters and I knocked them into shape. And he sold that to FSG. That those became Wolf and White Band. Right. Um, so but all this is because, like, you know, I have no illusions about it. If I had been, if I if I wasn't the Mountain Goats, he doesn't look me up, and I'm not standing here right now. Uh, I'm probably still playing up the street tomorrow. But uh, but but yeah, I I uh, I had an in. Um, you know, I think a lot about it because. I'm 100% certain that there are tens of thousands of writers who are my betters in every way, who don't have the access that I have, right? And I think one of the challenges facing publishing is, is how to address that, right? It's like, and, and this is not just across issues of fame, but gender, race, and class, all your standard barriers to access, right? Um, and, and the way to fix it isn't just by building our own presses, but it's by staffing the presses with people who, who can find those voices, you know? Um, but also, but once that happens, it also means, you know, making sure those voices aren't, you know, avoiding, avoiding even the appearance of tokenism, right? You want to actually be, 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 be making everything great as it can be. I, I think publishing is diversifying uh, pretty well now. In, in YA, this is happening at breakneck pace. Um, uh, but yeah, but, but me, 
I had an agent approach me. I'm blessed. <laughs> so. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all. So we have, uh, Dean has got five copies left, so don't go all running back to really quickly. Um, we're going to do signing here at this table. So if people could line up starting like right here, and then we will start bringing people around this way. I'm going to go grab a water. Yeah.